Hi, my name is Moti Ratmansky. I'm uh, holding two specialties, one in uh, pain medicine and the other in rehab. What I'm going to present you now is a clinical pre presentation about myofascial pain case, and we're going to discuss a little bit further about the, the idea of the clinical presentation behind it. So we'll take a case history to begin with. This is a 61-year-old guy, he's a car mechanic. He is suffering for the last two years from an aggravating pain in his shoulder uh, in the evening. He uh, mainly complains about limitation in his range of motion of shoulder. He cannot move his hand uh, freely. And his uh, visual analog scale somewhere between six to seven. He has already seen an orthopedic surgeon who injected his uh, shoulder with steroid, gave him some temporary relief and improvement, and his physiotherapist has treated him a couple of times. That, this has led to a better range of motion, but no uh, reduction of his pain. So at this stage, this guy, which you have probably seen in your clinic, or you might, or you will see in your clinic very often, he was sent to do an ultrasound. And his ultrasound fi findings were as follows. As you can see here, the arrow points toward his uh, supraspinatus muscle. And you can see a huge gap here. This is a partial tear of his uh, supraspinatus, uh, which lies right uh, beneath the deltoid and this uh, uh, thing you see here on the lower side of the picture, this is the humerus bone. So there is a tear in a supraspinatus. What are we going to do next? So there's a muscle, there is tear, pain. What one should do next? Should we go and try to aim our treatment toward this tear? Maybe to inject the tear, maybe to fill it out somewhere, somehow or to uh, uh, sew it, or to operate it, or to do an arthroscopy. What one should do with this tear? I'm going to stop my lecture here, and uh, we're going to, to, to stop this uh, reductionist way of thinking, and to try to zoom out and to think about something else. We'll move to uh, a different uh, subject, in a way, but obviously I'm going to move back to what we're talking about here. And we're going to, dis, uh, to discuss about this guy. His name is Buchmeister Fuller. Buchmeister Fuller he was uh, uh, an American engineer. He was the, the one to uh, invent the uh, geodesic dome, as you can see here on the right side of the picture. This is uh, taken from uh, uh, Montreal, Canada. That was a conference there, and you can see the dome. He was the one to uh, first uh, um, describe this uh, uh, idea of tensegrity. Tensegrity is a mixture of two words, tensional integrity. And, uh, he coined this term for uh, describing uh, the, uh, the model of tensegrity, which is basically a model based on compression and tension components. As you can see in this model, which I'm going to show you in my hand right now, I'm holding a model. There are those, uh, the, the, the solid parts, the rods, this is the solid component, and the tensile or the, uh, the wires are a flexible component. Now, when you squeeze this model, the tension is being spread around this model. Some parts, as you can see, some wire are getting tensed while the other are getting loose and the tension is not being spread around this model in a smooth and in equal manner. But once I leave it, when it gets back to its original position, then again the tension is being spread evenly throughout the wires and the, uh, this whole structure is coming back to its original uh, position, original way. Now, this uh, model of tensegrity uh, basically was also uh, originally was uh, described by this uh, sculpturist and artist Kenneth Nelson. Kenneth Nelson, as you can see here, has uh, created huge sculptures 
very, uh, as you can see, they are huge and they are uh, standing on a small area. Few rods are holding uh, a very sophisticated structure that go up to the clouds here. And this is, uh, and you can now try to figure out and you can see what I'm leading to you to is that it resembles in a way the human body. The human body, in a way, is you have these solid parts. The rods are basically the bones, and uh, the uh, soft parts and the wires are the uh, soft tissues, which is which are the ligaments, the muscles, the connective tissues, and the uh, uh, tendons. As you can see here, the bones are not attached to one each other, but are held in place by the tension created by the, by the soft tissue. So this is a revealing idea, because when you, we stand, we are not standing bone on bone. The tibia is not holding the femur, but the tension between the tibia and the femur is being held and spread by the, uh, the ligaments and by the soft tissues. And the soft tissue keeps one bone separate from another, and they trans they translate the the pressure and the and the uh, and the strength in between themselves. So the bone are not holding and passing the pressure and the stress from one bone to the other, but the soft tissue is the one to carry the stress. So in the same manner, you can see a model here of the human body on the left. You see two legs, and you can see the rods are not attached to one each other. And at the same manner, we can build this, describe the spine here, where you can see that the discs are not carry the weight, but the weight is being the, the, the vertebras actually are being separated one from another by these tensile forces from the wires. So the discs is basically not carrying, almost not carrying weight. Uh, not as we think it is, as, as uh, so, uh, so this is a new way, a new paradigm of looking at the human body. How does it all uh, relate to our issue of myofascial pain? So this is an idea, this is a model. The guy who took it a further step uh, on, forward, is a guy named uh, Tom Myers. Tom Myers has tried to show whether these uh, tissues are actually connected to one each other, and each coined the term anatomy trains. He, he went and he dissected bodies and, and uh, patients, uh, bodies of uh, cadavers, and to see whether they have uh, any connections between the soft tissues. So this is a general term for describing a system of 12 trains, resemble, uh, also coined and named myofascial meridians, and as Professor Feinstein has mentioned earlier, it in a way it uh, recalls the 12 meridians of the Chinese medicine. And amazingly, there is about 70 to 80 percent similarity in between those meridians. So this is amazing, uh, based on the uh, knowledge of the Chinese people and the uh, their tools to uh, to find out those meridians 2,000 or 3,000 years back. This is a practical method for postural patterns diagnosis and also helps to explain how points could be found remotely from the pain source. So an anatomical train is a volumetric line which follows direct tension lines. It's, it's a qualitatively similar continuous connective tissue. The, the connective tissue is in between on along this train should be similar. It has a similar uh, components. Basically, this is a chain of muscles connected with uh, in connective tissues in between them. It's like a chain of sausages. Not like the way we uh, learned it back in med school where we learned about origin, insertion and muscle. We now look at muscles in a train, one muscle connected to the other. So a railway is, uh, and the train is a chain of muscles or sausages, and the stations are the bones. Let's take one train for example. We'll take the superficial backline, which is one of the meridians described by uh, Tom Myers. 
so it all comes, if we follow it from uh, uh, bottom up, we can see it begins in the toe, the plantar flexor, flexors and the, the plantar fascia, and then it goes up to, through the calcaneal bone. It is connected to the Achilles tendon, goes up to the gastrocnemius, hamstrings, and along the back line, all the way up to the scalp, as you can see here. So uh, this is a line, this is a line of muscles and structures connected with connective tissue. So now we can find an explanation how uh, problems at, in the ankle, for instance, or a torn Achilles, or, a, a, or, a, or let's say tensed gastrocnemius can give rise to pain in the neck along the same train. Another example here is uh, if we take, for instance, the pectoralis minor. So we used to look at it as, it's, uh, as if it's a single part, separated from the rest, uh, begins at the, uh, its origin lies at the coracoid process of the scapula, and its uh, insertion it goes down to the ribs. But if you will try to look at it now as a continuity of fascia, we can find a train that begins in the hand, in the flexor muscles of the hand, goes up to the biceps brachii, short head in this case, goes to the coracoid process, then the pectoralis minor, which is being attached to the abdominal muscles and uh, ends at the pubic bone. Now, it gives us an explanation why, when we try to bring more strength and power to our hand while lifting ourselves up, it, it, it explains how power from the pelvis and the abdomen goes all the way up to the hand and we use our abdominal muscles to get more strength in order to hold things or to hold our own body weight. So when we, you, you try to think about trains and you begin to think about tensegrity, it gives you a very good idea how to approach a patient while having pain and uh, it has to be treated along the lines and along the body. How prevalent is myofascial pain? Myofascial pain is almost, almost every human being will have trigger points, which I'm soon about to explain, and myofascial pain at some point in his life. About 20% of the population suffers from myofascial pain at any given moment, and about 95% having chronic pain, no matter what uh, cause this chronic pain, even oncological pain or uh, others, other reasons of pain, they have some part at some part, they have myofascial component at their, of their pain. The six criteria described by Travel and Simon for a, a clinical diagnosis of trigger point, which is the hallmark of myofascial pain, these are as follows. First of all, there should be a typical radiation of pain in order to say that a certain point is a trigger point. A trigger point is a point where you get a radiation that typically follows a certain areas and certain regions of the body. So every muscle has its own typical radiation map, radiation uh, of pain arising from this muscle. This muscle is usually weak and has some sort of range of motion limitation. There's also a unique finding of what we call taut bend. Taut bend is, a, is, a, is a, uh, an area in that muscle that has inside itself some trigger points. So at, sometimes at the beginning we find a taut band and when we follow uh, this taut band we can look for trigger point inside that taut band. And this is the spot we are looking for. So a taut band is a hint where we can find our trigger points. Usually the trigger point is hypersensitive. Uh, following prolonged pressure it becomes hypersensitive. And there is a twitch response, which is a response while pressing, while pressing a, a trigger point or needling, dry needling it, or injecting it, we can see sometimes or feel between our fingers a twitch response, which is a very good sign that we uh, hit the right spot when we try to treat it. The disappearance of pain, obviously, is another sign of uh, a good treatment of a trigger point. A myofascial pain usually, when, when those trigger points arising, they're usually arising following either trauma 
or postural asymmetry, something that is congenital or following a surgery, for instance, hip surgery, when one is having his hip replaced and sometimes there is a new uh, uh, or a legs, uh, uh, length length discrepancy, then you have a certain change in your posture that after a while give rise to myofascial pain. Anxiety or chronic muscular tension give rise to uh, muscular uh, myofascial pain and radiculopathy or any problems with the uh, nerve conduction. So let's go back to the guy we began with. Uh, he has a shoulder pain. The pain increases while being active. That is causing him to uh, avoid activity. Once avoiding activity in one hand gives rise to overloading the other hand. So now the, under, the other hand muscles are working harder. Some neighboring muscles are joining this tension. So it gives rise to more pain, more shoulder pain, more activity avoidance, more overloading the contralateral side and the spine. And then neighboring muscle join and it becomes a syndrome. And, and so we began with one, mus one muscle and now we're having lots of muscle involved in this syndrome. So the, the, the chronic and the more time passes from the, uh, the original, uh, uh, the original uh, cause, then more muscles are joining and it becomes uh, more difficult to treat. So the sooner you treat it, the better results you get. A shoulder myofascial pain where trigger points become chronic, the ability to muscle to stretch within normal range of motion is diminished, obviously, and sometimes it resembles frozen shoulders, even though you don't have findings in the ultrasound or MRI, but it is like someone with frozen shoulder with a, with, a, with, a, with a pronounced range of motion limitation. The treatment is aimed toward muscle release and strengthening of muscles, and often the pain is merely radiation from a different origin, so we have to look for the origin of pain in the muscles involved. Uh, the treatment in this case was dry needling to the shoulder muscles, as we're going to show you soon, and along the, uh, the relevant anatomical train. And he was given exercise for strengthening the lower trapezius in this case and the infrastenatus bilaterally. He became much better. To summarize the last slide, uh, the whole shoulder gilder should be examined in a holistic approach, uh, in a biotensegratory way, as uh, described. Myofascial pain can resemble frozen shoulder and might accompany such syndrome as it becomes chronic. In order to reach satisfactory and long-lasting results in treating pain, one should always be aware of the potential presence of myofascial pain. And uh, myofascial pain should be always suspected in any case of pain complaints, no matter what their origin is. Thank you. Mm -hmm.